So the final video in this chapter is section 5, which we'll be covering water. And the first thing we're going to be doing is looking at the structure of water. Now water isn't particularly unique in its structure. If you'll remember, it has a bent structure with two hydrogen atoms and an oxygen atom over here. And because oxygen is more electronegative, it tends to uh, have the electrons over here with it more often than the hydrogens do. So oxygen, if we just redraw that diagram for more clarity, tends to have a negative pole over here and then two smaller positive poles over here. And these poles along the atom allow it to form hydrogen bonds. That is, the extra hydrogens out here, which are essentially free protons almost, they occasionally get an electron that comes their way. Uh, are then attracted to the oxygen ends of other water molecules. This means that when water fully solidifies and it tends to go into its most uh, stable form as ice, it will tend to form sort of hexagons of uh, water molecules where each one is sort of chained up to the ones around it. You know, in a hexagon of sorts. Now, I do a bad job of representing it here, but it is a three-dimensional shape, so it's very hard to represent. But you can see the negative attracts the positive all the way round. Now, this empty space here in the middle actually has nothing in it. So in its solid form, that is ice right here, it forms these sort of hexagons with the empty space right there. And this empty space actually makes ice more, or actually less dense rather than water, which is why if you have a cup of water, the ice cubes will tend to float to the top because they have molecules linked together in such a way that they are less dense due to this empty space in the middle. This also means that when you freeze water, it actually expands to make room for this extra part in the middle. Now as you heat the water up, let's say there's a flame or something to heat the water up, uh, and you start to, these molecules start to vibrate faster and faster, up and down, up and down, eventually they will break free from their hydrogen bonds at least more so than they were in this stable hexagon form and they will start to fill in this empty area in the middle and this means that liquid water just before the boiling point at about four degrees celsius remember the boiling point is zero degrees celsius at about four degrees celsius the water tends to become its most dense because that's when there's the least amount of space between molecules and there's no empty space due to a crystal forming in the shape of a hexagon. Now we're going to be moving on to the properties of water and this section is mostly going to be me just dictating numbers to you. For example, uh, to start, we just talked about uh, ice, represented by these cubes, uh, floating in a glass of water and this again is because of the hexagonal shape with the empty space in the middle that ice crystals form and when you do the math and account for the empty space within the ice crystals you end up with ice having a density of about 0.92 grams per cubic centimeter now by contrast water has for all intents and purposes a density of one gram per cubic centimeter. And we'll need this number a lot more later on, but the molar enthalpy of fusion of ice or water in general is about six kilojoules per mole. That means you need to input about six kilojoules of heat per mole at the freezing temperature to turn 
uh, one mole of ice into one mole of liquid water. And this is a lot relative to things of similar mass to water that are nonpolar. For instance, uh, methane, CH4, has a much lower value. But this is because water has to overcome the strong hydrogen bonds. And these are the same hydrogen bonds that form the hexagonal structure within ice. Now the molar enthalpy of vaporization of water is about 40.79 kilojoules per mole. And this again is relatively high because once again you have to break the strong hydrogen bonds which are among the strongest intermolecular forces uh, in order to change a mole of water into a mole of water vapor. And these two properties, the high molar enthalpies of fusion and vaporization, make water extremely useful for cooling because not a lot of water can do a lot of absorption of energy due to uh, these molar enthalpies as well as the specific heat which we'll discuss later. To finish up here we're going to do a sample problem of something which you might use the actual uh, molar enthalpy of fusion uh, for. For example if you wanted to know how much energy is absorbed when 47 grams of ice melt. So the first thing you would do is you would take 47 grams of water and find how many moles of water you have. So you'd have to use the molar mass like we did with our stoichiometry earlier. And that happens to be 18.02 grams per mole. And again you cancel out the grams and you end up with 2.61 moles of water. Now if you want to find the energy released once that water freezes you would take the 2.61 moles of water and multiply by the molar enthalpy of fusion. So for each mole of water about 6 kilojoules are released when it freezes. So you do the math and you end up with about 15.7 15 uh, kilojoules of energy are released when 47 grams of water freeze.